Hey, Jim Wolf here, and the book I want to talk with you about today is called A Billion Wicked Thoughts by Ogi Ogus and Sai Gadam. And I'm sure that you're not interested in the topic of this book because it's about human sexuality. And I know nobody's interested in that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you some of the things that they talked about in the book. I'm not going to draw any conclusions for you. I'll let you make your own conclusions. And I'll just let you know, this is one of the few books that I've lent out to people that I actually get back. In fact, I've lent it out to four or five different people, and every single person has given it back to me within a week because they read it that fast, because it's that interesting. And for me, I read it in about two days. So if you pick up this book, A Billion Wicked Thoughts by Ogi Ogus and Sai Gadam, I'm pretty sure that you'll finish it in a week or less because you won't be able to stop reading it. It's really, really interesting. And what these two neuroscientists did is they took the current neuroscience literature and their work in the field of neuroscience, and then they also analyzed over a billion points of data from the internet, from what people are searching for on Google, to pornography sites, to anything like that that's related to human sexuality that shows how people actually behave and not necessarily how they report that they behave on like a survey or something like that. So this is a really interesting book. If you're interested at all in the topic of human sexuality, I definitely recommend it. But I wanna share just a few things that I thought were interesting from the book. And again, I'll let you draw your own conclusions about what they mean. So the first one is that male and female brains are wired fundamentally differently when it comes to sexuality. And what the research shows right now is that females require six times the number of cues to be aroused at the same level as it takes to arouse a male brain with one cue. So a male brain gets aroused with one sexual cue that they see out there in the world. Whereas a female brain, it takes six of those cues for them to reach that same level of arousal. And I think that can explain a lot of the things that we see from, you know, advertising that objectifies people. It's, it doesn't just happen to women where they present like one body part, for example. Uh, it also happens in homosexual male advertising. And so you'll see that, you know, the difference between the male and female brain where the male brain is aroused by one cue at the same level as a female brain is aroused by six cues. So there's a difference in what it takes to get a male and female brain aroused. And I think uh, that idea goes a long way to explaining a lot of the things that we see out there. And of course, I'm not saying it's right to objectify anyone. I don't think that that's okay in any case, but it definitely explains why there's a difference if marketers are targeting specific groups. And then the second thing that I learned from this book is that homosexual men have a male sexual brain. So they still respond to the one cue at the same level as a heterosexual male. The one difference between the heterosexual and homosexual male brain is that the homosexual male brain is aroused by masculinity cues in the environment, whereas the heterosexual male brain is aroused by femininity cues. So the male brain is wired fundamentally the same way. It's just a matter of whether or not it gets aroused by femininity or masculinity cues. And then the third thing I learned from A Billion Wicked Thoughts is that sexuality is a spectrum. That's a pretty common idea out there now. We know it's not a binary. It's more flexible than we used to think. So there's not just heterosexual and homosexual. There's a full spectrum of sexuality and female brains happen to be more fluid along that spectrum. Another thing that I learned from A Billion Wicked Thoughts is that in a female brain, the physical and mental arousal systems are separate. Whereas in a male, physical and mental arousal is not separate. So for example, a female could be physically aroused and not be aware of it because those two processes are separate. Whereas in a male, they are exactly the same. The physical and mental arousal of males is one process. Whereas in females, the physical and mental arousal processes are not 
the same thing. You can have one without the other, or you can have both at the same time. And I think that's interesting and explains a lot as well. And then socialization. This is kind of still a debate out there whether or not sexuality can be socialized. You know, do we imprint on certain things when we're young and then we're attracted to that later? Does what happens to us when we're younger influence our sexuality or our sexual orientation at some point? And they provide a really interesting case study about the socialization of sexuality. And what they talk about in the book is a tribe of people in Papua New Guinea called the Sambia. And what's interesting about the Sambia, among other things, is that they have a belief that for a boy to become a man, they have to ingest the semen of older boys because they think that you get masculinity from ingesting semen. And so in Sambia culture, the young boys fellate a little bit older boys as part of their coming of age process. It's part of them becoming a man. And so in the Sambia culture, all of the young boys are fellating older boys as practice. And if things that happen when we're young affect our sexual orientation and who we're attracted to and what we're attracted to, you would expect to find a higher rate of homosexual men in the Sambia society than you would in other societies. And what researchers and anthropologists have found is that the Sambia people have roughly the same rate of homosexuality among their males as any other Western population. And in fact, almost all of them are only attracted to women later on in their life, and they're happy only with women later in their life. And so that's a really interesting case study that kind of shows that maybe socialization has a little bit less of an effect than we think. And there's also the studies that show that uh, faces are rated in the same order of attractiveness across cultures. So I'm not sure about this. I think it's still an open question as to uh, what people's tastes are sexually and how our culture affects that. But I think uh, the Sambia case study provides a really strong example of the fact that what we're attracted to is probably more determined by things that happen hormonally during pregnancy. Um, and so I think it's really interesting and you should read it for yourself and make your own decision about that. And then the last thing that was really interesting about this book is just the sheer variety of what turns people on. It was fascinating to me. I found out that I'm actually kind of boring in this area. There's some people, for example, who are turned on by balloons. And I thought that was really interesting. And so, hey, whatever floats your boat. Um, there's probably other people that like what you're into as well. So anyway, people have a very large variety of things that can turn them on. And then as a bonus, a word that I learned from this book is called a squick. And a squick is something that repulses you or turns you off sexually. And the researchers who wrote the book say that they think that squicks kind of help, especially the male brain that's so aroused by one cue, they think that squicks kind of help the male brain focus on an appropriate target and that that has helped our survival and that kind of a trait would be selected over time. And so it kind of makes sense that we'd be repulsed by certain things to keep us on the right path as far as survival goes. And so that's where they think squicks come from, but you can add this to your vocabulary. A squick is something that turns you off and usually turns you off a lot. Uh, and so with that, those are some of the awesome things I learned from A Billion Wicked Thoughts. I highly encourage you to get this book for yourself. See what you think about it. Decide for yourself what the things in this book means. But I can almost guarantee you that if you get this book, you won't be able to put it down. Now go have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks for checking out The Jim Wolf Show. For my best exclusive content, sign up for my awesome free newsletter at jamesdwolf.com. That's James D wolfwithanee.com. I'll see you there.